No. I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. We just pray that you would guide our thoughts and just help us to accomplish much with the time we have, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Oh, man, I hope I don't get sick. Um, <laughs> two children already. It's not good. So, okay, so up to this point, I have essentially explained what we mean by taking a derivative with respect to a, an algebra variable. Um, and um, if you really look at it, formally what we've shown is that you basically have calculus one with respect to algebra variables. And then, okay, if you want to contact the underlying real structure, you've got to look at the Cauchy-Riemann equations, and that's more subtle. Um, the end of last class, I showed how we can take any real partial derivative and recast it as a sum of algebra and conjugate variable derivatives, right? Um, so uh, it'd probably be good for me to make up some homework problems so you guys actually get to do that over some other algebras that are in the paper. Um, I'll put that on my list of things to do. So for now, I want to try to talk about the idea of, um, I, I would say conformal, but that's kind of the wrong, wrong term for it. Um, so let me, let me tell you the, the basic idea. And, and, and so let's start with complex analysis, all right? So in complex analysis, the thing that's kind of neat is if we have, you know, um, the xy plane, and then, let's see here, we map over to the uv plane, right? Something like w equals to you know, f of z, right? Um, well, if, if f prime of z, right, if f prime of, of, of z is not equal to zero at all points in consideration, then, then it's conformal. And what that means specifically, and, and this usage of conformal is more general than complex analysis. Conformal usually means preserves the angle between, I mean, you got some notion of angle, and that angle is preserved in the map, you know? Um, so in, in that sense, if we look at two lines that intersect in the, in the domain, they'll be mapped to the image of the pair, the image will have the same angle, you know? If I take this line and that line, and we look at the tangents, this theta, and if you look at the image of those over here, you know, and you look at the angle between those, we get the same thing, right? So maybe this is gamma 1, this is gamma 2. Over here, you're looking at f of gamma 1. Well, yeah, I guess f composed of gamma 1 and f composed of gamma 2. So the, um, and the, and the proof that, you know, these are conformal in that sense is it's just, you know, if you differentiate with respect to time, f um, composed with gamma of t, right, we get um, df dz of gamma of t times d gamma dt. Or in the other notation, that's f prime of gamma of t times d gamma dt, right? So the new velocity vector to the image path is related to the old velocity vector by multiplication by the complex derivative, which itself is a complex number, right? But that is a fixed complex number for the point in question. So when I look at the curve gamma 1, I look at the curve gamma 2, we're multiplying them both by the same complex number. And if that's non-zero, that corresponds to a dilation and a rotation, right? And it's the same one for both, so the angle between them is not modified. I mean, you can specifically calculate this and, you know, calculate the angle out in gory detail, but that's, that's what it is. Um, so that's why a complex, um, such a map in the complex sense is called conformal. It's angle preserving between paths. Great. So, I mean, that's true. But what's perhaps more interesting is to, let's see here. I need to, I am, it is very, there's a very high likelihood I butcher what I'm about to try. Let <laughs> me do it over here. Um, let's see. What if I look at 
Oh, goodness. Do you have a specific example in mind, Cooper, that you might want me to work out? I'm still thinking complex at the moment. Um, let's see here. How about um, the thing I can't remember is where I put the. Do I put the easy thing in the domain or the in the range? What I can't remember is where I. <laughs> Um, in the range, okay. So suppose I want, you know, I want a solution to Laplace's equation, um, which is, you know, maybe on this annulus. So I think <sighs> maybe I should shoot smaller than that. Um, All right, this is where having this being the third class I'm teaching is really hurting. If I um, was, this is the first thing I had that's already prepared, and so I'm wasting your time now, I'm sorry. Um, we could look at, for example, the argument function, right? Um, the argument function, not defined here. Um, oh, that's not what I want either. I'm sorry, guys. I, I Just a second, let me. I'm, I'm the worst when I'm trying to come up with an example when I'm tired. I, there's no telling what I will do. I definitely have these in my complex notes. I just need to look them up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what I want. Oh. Too, too horrible. I don't want, that's not, that's not the, uh, that's not, not what we want at the moment. Come on. The trouble is I can't remember where I put the conformal mapping in my course. I think I did it earlier. In principle, you can do it as soon as you've covered. Uh, you know, often in the in the courses that you take, you'll see it. Um, it ends up getting pushed to the like very end of the course, but in principle, you can cover it much earlier because it really is just based on the chain rule, and noticing that. Um, your every every complex function, the component functions, are solutions to Laplace's equation. So that's that's kind of the driving um, technology, so to speak. Here's one. All right. Find the steady state heat distribution for a circular plate of radius one for which the upper edge is held at constant temperature 1 and the lower edge is held at constant temperature minus 1. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, I'm sorry, it's, it's just really, it's, it's too far into my course. This is not helpful. Um, hmm. Well, maybe this is helpful. Uh, 
Ay, ay, ay. Oh, okay, so let me just, I need to write some things down. Maybe it'll, it'll shake something loose for me. What if we look at the, um, the log of a complex variable z, right? Um, this is equal to what? This is equal to the natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the arg of z. This is what we learn. And that, that's for the slit complex plane. So this is for basically, you, gotta, you, you, you have to avoid the uh, negative real axis. That no, is no allowed. But uh, z can be anywhere else. Okay. So. So that, that um, well, I mean, anyway, that, that if you have, there's a discontinuity for the log there at a minimum. So, and the origin's hopeless. Right. What's the angle of the origin? Yeah, right. Um, so let's see here. If, um, I'm trying to think. How's this thing, what are the, what are the level, I'm trying to think of some, um, you know, how's this behave? Um, oh, 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 oh. So the real part of the log of z, right? is the natural log of the absolute value of z, right? So if we do something like a constant, say r times log z, right? Then the real part of that is just what? It's r times the natural log of the absolute value of z, right? And so if I wanted a solution to Laplace's equation, See, the thing is, um, you know, if I call this thing f of z, right, then this is my quote-unquote u, this is my quote-unquote v, and um, we know from what we talked about in previous classes that those satisfy the Laplace equation for the complex numbers, which is the Laplace equation. It's uxx plus uyy equal to zero, you know, um, dxx plus dyy equal to zero. But suppose I want, to find, I want to find a solution to Laplace's equation which has the property its value is, you know, 10 um, on the, um, you know, circle of radius, uh, what do you want? One, sure. So suppose we want, we want to find a solution which has, you know, phi equals to 10 um, at this radius 1, right? Then if we use, so if we, if we look at the, you know, the real component of 10 times the log of z, right? That, that thing, that u, well, if I call that phi, right? If that's my, um, my phi of of z, I suppose, that, that does what? That has, well, first of all, this is a solution to Laplace's equation, right? And it satisfies the boundary condition of being 10 on that unit circle. Um, let's see here. To be more specific, the, the, I'm not sure I want to use z there. I think I want to use, yeah. So King looked. Uh, should be. But what you really wanted to tell me is that's supposed to be a w. Thank you. Right. Because. <clears throat> you think the what? No, I was just thinking on the radius one, we have a oh. <laughs> and then you have a group of uh, uh, Oh, 
you're right. I need to think harder about this. So if I want this to be equal to 1, right? Oh. <laughs> Uh, stink. So one is unit circle. Curses. Ah. I guess what I should do is log of z plus a constant, you know? natural log of z plus the real part of the constant, right? If I do that, then this would still be... <sighs> All right, so then I'm saying phi of w. I want w's here, right? Phi of w is the real part of the log of w plus this complex constant, right? Which let's 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 say that the constant is um, is c1 plus c is i c2. Um, so what would that be? That would be, and I'm I'm I lost my my r. You could put an A there instead of R, right? Um, I'll put an A. Um, so we get A, natural log, the absolute value of W, plus C1, right? But I think we can choose A and C1. We can choose A and C1 such that the value of phi is a constant of 10 all around the unit circle. Um, but to make it more exciting, to make it more exciting, let's make this the circle of radius 2. Better? Radius E? What do you want? 2? Okay. So, what's that? A phi of, what do you say? 7? Curse you, Joe. He's still here. Alright, so, no, I refuse. A times the natural log, the you got me, I was about to write down 7, thanks a lot. Uh, natural log the absolute value of 2, you know, plus C1, that's supposed to be equal to 10. Right. Oh. Oh, I guess I can, I can, I, can, I guess I can put the C1 equal to 0. Am I missing something here? I mean, I mean, we, we have we have two times in principle. We have two times e to the i theta, right? I mean, <laughs> typical point here is two e to the i theta, right? I want those points all to be mapped to ten under phi. I think we can choose a and c, um, c one to make that happen. Um, for example, choose C1 equal to 0, right? And choose A equal to what? I think A has to be 10 over log 2, right? All right, so um, great. So we've got this function, right? V of w equals to 10 divided by the natural log of 2 times the natural log um, um, natural log of the absolute value of w, right? plus 10i over the natural log of 2 times arg of w, right? This is a function defined in the w plane, right? 
which takes the value 10 as the circle of radius 2, and whose component functions are solutions to the Laplace equation in that. I mean, the, these will satisfy, this satisfies like phi u u plus phi v v equal to 0. Um, to be more explicit, right, this is actually what? This is actually <clears throat> 5 over the natural log of 2, the natural log of u squared plus v squared, right, um, plus 10i over log 2 inverse tangent of um, v over u. Now here I'm of course assuming that we're, I'm just for the sake of discussion, we're where we can use inverse tangent to get the uh, standard angle. But of course, generally, you'd have to use the arg. Okay. So what? Well, this in, this in and of itself is not too interesting. The question is, what function can we take from here to here to get to that circle? How can we map something different onto that circle? over in the xy plane. How can we map to that circle? Can you guys give me a function that will map to the circle in, a, in, a, in some kind of non-trivial sense? How about this? Could you find me, um, maybe can we find some map which maps the upper half plane? to the circle. To the disk. So, I don't know. I can think about this point, this point, and I don't know, I guess yet. Um, infinity somewhere over here. Or over here, why not? I don't know, whatever. Um, and so maybe mapping the, maybe mapping zero, uh, I guess we could map zero to um, zero to minus one. And uh, so, so if you, if this is the order of the points, right? Zero, one, and infinity. Going that way, then the, the interior is on the left. So I, I, I want to map these to a triple of points over on the circle where the, um, the interior is on the, on the left. So I guess I should, I should maybe map that to 1 and um, maybe map. So map 0 to 1, maybe map um, 1 to i, maybe map uh, infinity to minus 1. This is the thing I'm looking for. Zero maps, to, or I'm going to try to look for it. Anyway. Zero maps to one. Um, one maps to i. And um, infinity maps to minus one. Can we find such, a, such an f of z? Um, I don't know, I just want to try to find it. I mean, maybe. I'm a little rusty. I think I'd be wrong. I'm, I'm trying to remember how this goes. I think... I'm trying to think. I might have an easier time going the other way. Uh, it's, I'm going to try to go in this way instead, okay, guys? I'm going to try to find F inverse. You know? Like, what's F inverse of W? So I want to send, I want to send 1. I want to send 1 to 0. So what do you do? How about uh, W minus 1? That ought to do that. 
and I want to send uh, I want to send minus one to infinity. So probably doing this should help me out with that. Then all that's left is to pick a scale factor, right? So this time some scale factor a, or perhaps complex number a. So I, I need f inverse. So I'll, just, I'll figure out what a is from the remaining point. F inverse of what do I want? F inverse of i is equal to a times i minus one over i plus one, and that's going to be equal to one. So pick a equal to i plus one over i minus one, which of course we can trade for minus one minus i minus one minus i, which is equal to what? I mean, I'll do the easy part, the denominators too. What's that numerator work out to? You got a minus i, um, plus one, minus one, minus two i, right? Oh, check that out, just minus i. So apparently, this is the inverse of the map I'm looking for. Unsettling? You're telling me that you have this uh, projection and homomorphism? Because I think that is not possible. But this is compact, but the half plane is closed. Isn't? They both close, but they. But the, it's the half plane with infinity. Oh. It's the one point compactification. Yeah. But. Your rejection on the basis of compactness, I'm happy with. It's just this sneaky thing we did to joining the point in infinity. It takes the plane and turns it into the Riemann sphere. Yeah. So, but now what's the, so there's, the, that apparently is the inverse of the map I'm looking for, right? <laughs> Let me write it down up here for, for the record. F inverse of W is I times 1 minus w over um, 1 plus w, right? So what's f then? You set this thing equal to z and solve for w, right? Solve for w, that gives us f. You guys do that for me? I'm tired. <laughs> get us started. That's z plus zw is equal to i minus iw, which is to say that z plus i times w is equal to i minus z, which is to say that w is equal to i minus z over z plus i. So there's the map we're looking for i minus z over z plus i. My claim is that map maps the upper half plane to the interior of that unit too. Oh, schnikes. Aw, oh, man. Come on. I changed it back to the unit disk. Right, I changed it back to the disk. Dang it. You see what happened? Oh, I don't want to. Dang it.
Um, the weird thing is, it seems like we can use any multiple of the logarithm and still get 10, right? Like, I'm, I feel like I'm missing something because something I'm missing here, guys. I'm sorry, this has got to be painful to watch. Um, yeah, yeah, badness. Um, Yeah, what I'm, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to do here is to get a non-trivial mapping from here to here and then to steal the solution we find over here back to here. Um, but um, the two is a problem at the moment. What if I, if I make that one, can I fix this? I think I can. I think it's fastest just to fix this. Uh, I think, um, well, you know what, there are, I think I know what to do. I think I know what to do. Let me, let me fix it. So we'll just use phi of w equal to um, the log of w plus 10. I think that, that is, that ought to do it. I mean, so this has natural log the absolute value of w plus 10 plus i times the arg of w. Um, so, so the the real part of phi. Is, is 10 on the unit circle, right? I mean, that, that what's bothering me is I can't shake the feeling that I could have done otherwise. Hmm? Phi is the solution to Laplace's equation in the, in the UW plane, the UV plane. So w, w is equal to u plus iv here. So I'm using u and v for coordinates in the, in the target. And I'm also using u and v for the component functions of the function f. It, it is a little bit of an abusive notation. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, I, I like the logarithm because it, it, it allows me to get a constant value on a circle without a lot of thinking. You could pick other functions. Other functions would have, you know, they would fit other boundary conditions in some sort of characteristic way. But uh, that, log that logarithm would not map uh, upper half plane to it. It would not, right. But here's the point. So <laughs> I hope I don't need any of that. <laughs> um, so. Where is, where, is the, where is phi in the picture? That's a good question. That's the thing that's missing. So phi, right here, right? Where's phi going to? Phi is complex value, right? So phi is going to yet another copy of the complex, which I don't even have letters for, right? But the point is, you could also go from here to here. With what map? Yeah, you said phi. Sideways TIE fighter, composed of phi. Yeah. Right. And this, so phi composed with f, we could call this psi, right? So psi of z 
is P of F of Z. What's that? I think so. But in order to do this well, I still need to do more here, right? I need to find the real, I need to find the U and V components for that, right? That's not entirely trivial. That's, that's, that's I minus X minus IY, right? Divided by X plus IY plus I. So what's that work out to? In other words, we've got minus x um, minus i times y plus 1, right? Divided by x plus i times y plus 1. So we, we need to, this is what? Yeah. So this is really minus x minus i times y plus 1 times x minus i times y plus 1, right? Divided by x squared plus y plus 1 squared. Right? And so what's that numerator work out to? I'll do it down here, right? So we got what? You have minus x squared. What's the other real component? Um, minus y plus 1 squared. And then what's the imaginary part? Um, minus i times what? Times x times y plus 1. Oh, is the imaginary part 0? Right there. This is a minus. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, okay. So how's that? This only works if we're careful. <laughs> right? Um, what's that give me? Minus x squared minus y squared plus 1, right? Plus i times what? I'll do some parentheses here. So we've got x times y plus 1, right? Minus x times y minus 1. And that's all divided by x squared plus y plus 1 squared. Doesn't matter. So. Ignore that for the moment. <laughs> Z equals minus i. Impossible. Actually, that's impossible. We don't care about that because it's down here. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you, you, I hear you. So 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And does this stuff cancel over here? It does, right? That. And we just get what? Plus 2, 2ix two over x squared plus y plus 1 squared. And now phi. Phi of that. What's phi of that? Well, I really just want the real part of psi, okay? Let me focus in on that. So what's the real part of this? That's 10, right? 10 plus the log. the natural log of the absolute value of w, right? So what's the absolute value of w? Well, that's, we could write it as one half the natural log of what? Um, 
1 minus x squared minus y squared squared um, plus 2x quantity squared all divided by x squared plus y plus 1 quantity squared squared. What happens to that expression? If you put in y equals to 0, what happens with y equals to 0 in that? Look at that. You got x squared squared, x to the fourth, plus 1, minus 2x squared, compensates, 2x squared. This is x to the fourth, plus 2x squared, plus 1, also known as x squared plus 1 squared. This, my friends, is 1, which means this log vanishes on the y equals 0 axis, leaving us 10. This is a solution to Laplace's equation on the upper half plane, which takes the value 10 on the real axis. If I haven't made a mistake. This is encouraging, though. So the idea, let me restate the idea. So the idea is you look in the, in the target space and um, you, you find some pet solution that you like of Laplace's equation in the target space that satisfies a boundary condition that you're fond of, right? Then you look for a function f which takes that shape as its image. The inverse image of this thing, all right, well then, so the inverse image of the circle, the inverse image of the circle is the real axis under the map f with infinity adjoined. Um, but the inverse, the inverse image of the circle is, is in fact the, um, I mean, if you want to throw out infinity, I guess it's actually the inverse image of what? The uh, circle with, with, with minus one removed, right? I didn't remember right. Which one I, I forgot which one I, I've erased my f now, so I, I'm, I've lost my way. But anyway, the inverse image of the circle is the, is, is the real axis. And so that's the, that's the neat thing is if you, you know, this is, this is the technique is to um, look at the composition of the solution, your pet solution in the target space with this map, which takes whatever data you're, you know, whatever you actually, what you're actually after is finding the boundary the solution to the bound. You're actually after finding solution to the process equation on the real axis. This is just a very sneaky way to go about it. This is this is the technique of conformal mapping, in the most confusing way possible presented. So sorry. To recap, you find something you like <laughs> over here it with your favorite pet solution and then <clears throat> the inverse image of that will pick up that boundary condition um, for the solution constructed like psi. This, this, the psi solution is your, your pet solution in the target composed with the, the image, uh, composed with the function um, from the xy plane to the w plane like that. There, I mean there are other things um, if you wanted something, I mean, this almost the same sort of, I mean, you could look at other things like, 
you know, wedges. You could, you could want zero on the lower wedge and a constant on the upper wedge. The, the arg is the way to go because that's, that's angle. I mean, if, if you want zero here and, and, and you want 10 here at pi over 4, what do you do? You use um, arg, what, arg of, arg of w. Um, and if we want that to be 10, when we're at pi over 4, what do we do? Get rid of the pi over 4, multiply by 4 over pi. So this function will be 0 on the u-axis, and it'll be 10 along the pi over 4, right? And you can make that, 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 that could be the real component of a particular uh, holomorphic function. I mean, this is, for what it's worth, this is like the, the real component of minus i um, times 10, well, times 40 over pi log of w. Because the i, you get plus i arg w, and the i times minus i gives you plus 1, which gets us back to what I have. Now, I have no earthly idea if you filter that thing through that f, what's the inverse image? What's the inverse image of this sector back over there? But you could figure it out, and in so doing, you'd find a solution to the wave equation, excuse me, a solution to Laplace's equation in the xy plane that has 0 on one edge and 10 on the other. There are complex variables books that have like dozens of pages of ideas, templates, model before and afters that will fit the problem that you desire. I mean, there's, 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 there's much more to this technique that, that to be systematic. If I taught this as a regular course, I, I'd have a, by now I would have told you 30, 30 times as much as I have. I mean, th this is a standard technique. There are phone books full of, um, and also this thing I did with this map, th this is, this is a, one of these uh, Mobius transformations. There's a standard cross-ratio technique to come up with this formula. You don't have to do the thing I did. I mean, that's the ad hoc way. There is, there's a standard calculational technique. You give me any three points and another three points, there is a, a fractional linear transformation that will take those three points to those three points. And in so doing, map circles to circles or planes to half planes to half planes. There's so much more to say about complex. So Cooper's project, <laughs> roughly speaking, is to try to do this same kind of thing over the hyperbolic numbers. But in the hyperbolic numbers, OK, so the component functions of holomorphic functions satisfy Laplace's equation, right? The component functions of hyperbolic differentiable functions satisfy what? The wave equation, right? Um, but you notice, by the way, that, OK, the conformal, right? What does conformal have to do with this mapping idea? You see it doesn't. It doesn't. It's a pullback idea. It's really divorced from the particular idea of conformality. Here's the big picture. If we can solve wave equation, let's say with phi, right, of w, use the same notation, all right, so that means phi is actually mapping from the, um, let's say, u, v plane, down here to the unnamed hyperbolic plane, right, then if we also have a function, right, from over here in our x, y, hyperbolic plane, then we can also construct the sort of, I wouldn't say conformal, but kind of like the conformal idea, really the pullback idea, um, f, oh, sorry, phi composed with f. <clears throat> More specifically, this, um, you know, fitting 
you know, blah. Um, well, let's see here. Phi of W equals to Pac-Man, <laughs> right? Um, for W in some S. S is some subset of that space, right? Over here, you have the inverse image of that subset. S was the circle in the complex example. The inverse image of S, the boundary, all right? Maybe I should say, well, that's the, that's the thing I got to be careful about. Um, I mean, I want to think about, I really want to think about, uh, this, may, this may be where I get into trouble. I want to think about being, the, I want to be, be in the boundary of S. I want S to look something like, I don't know, this. I want S to be some sort of simply connected something in the hyperbolic plane, the U, the U V W hyperbolic plane. And I want, I think the inverse image should also be some sort of simply connected, maybe I'm wrong about that, is the inverse image, if you have a hyperbolic, if you have a hyperbolic differentiable map, is it true that the inverse image of a simply connected region over there is a simply connected region over there? It's hyperbolic, non-zero, not just non-zero. Let us suppose invertible. So uh, it seems to me the condition ought to be that f prime of z is in, is not an element of the zero divisors of h, okay? To be fair, it seems, if I had to guess, to be careful about this stuff, we're going to need that condition. Um, but over here, what I want to say is that psi of z is equal to Pac-Man for what? For z, an element of the boundary, of the inverse image of the boundary of s. And by the way, by the way, I would like to think that the boundary of the inverse image of s is in fact the inverse image of the boundary of s. In other words, boundaries map to boundaries. Otherwise, it really hurts my head. I think these things could be established with some of the usual topological arguments. Probably more, more or less divorced from what we're doing. That's my speculation. But that's, the, that's what I mean by conformal mapping for you. It's not conformal in the sense of angle preserving. What it is, is following the same idea of pullback, the same idea of using you know, this, this diagram to construct solutions. Now, the one that we did before that we were successful in was just like the one we have actually um, looked at. So here, let me, let me show you guys what Cooper and I, we, we did like, what, a year ago? Yeah. <clears throat> so what we, 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 we actually looked at, um, so for phi, we, we actually did look at phi of w equal to, um, Log of log of w. And in the hyperbolic context, that works out to the natural log of the uh, absolute value of what is it? U squared minus I think u squared minus u squared minus v squared. Okay, and then plus j inverse hyperbolic tangent of v over u. Now this is going to be for um, this is just for this sector in here. So this, this is the point I'm talking about in here somewhere. It's between, these are the, you know, this is the span of 1 plus j. Here is part of the span of 1 minus j, real span, of course. Right? So that, that is a solution to the wave equation. Because it's a hyperbolic differentiable function, the real and imaginary components of those are separately hyperbolic, are, are separately hyper, um, 
solutions to the to the wave equation in the sense that um, we have phi u u minus phi v v equals to zero. That that follows from the stuff we looked at last class. Now the mapping. So like, what mapping did we look at? We looked at. Okay, so let me set up the picture. So we, we actually looked at the mapping f of z equal to jz. <laughs> jz. Um, sorry, I'm an idiot. Um, so uh, f of z equal to jz, what is that? That f of x plus jy, right, is equal to j times x plus jy, which is y plus jx. So you see what the what we got here. We've got u equal to y. We've got v equals to x in the simple example. What's the inverse image of that sector? Back to the xy plane. see here. Um, for example, here you've got 1, right? What's the inverse image of 1 under f? It's j, right? If I look at this point, I think it maps to like where this point, this point maps to like that point. Anyway, it's this one at least, the boundary maps to the boundary, right? And so this is a typical z, then. So we look at psi of z equal to f of, what was it? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't do math. Um, phi, psi is tie fighter, of f of z, right? But in this context, what is that? That's phi. What was f of z? It was y plus jx, right? Or more to the point, I can just, you know, what I'm going to do eventually is just take these and plug them up in there, right? And so that is the log, natural log, of um, y squared minus x squared um, plus j times the inverse hyperbolic tangent of um, x over y. And that, each component function to that is separately a solution in the, in the, red, the red sector, right? For example, let's see here. So if we just pick on the real part, what's the real part of this? The real part of um, real part of phi of w is what? Natural log of u squared minus v squared, right? So how does that behave um, in that sector? What happens as you approach the zero divisor? lines. What happens as you go to u equal to plus or minus v? Right, it, it goes to minus infinity. And um, on the real axis, how does it behave? If we look at the, the real axis right here. 